The song from the woods first called to me on a bright June morning while I sat on the back porch swing rereading my favorite cookbook. I could only hear a few notes, a small taste of a half-remembered melody that meandered through the air, but I was instantly hungry to hear the whole thing and discover where it came from. I crossed the yard and stopped at the edge of the woods. As the music drifted toward me like an irresistible aroma, I held my breath and stepped into the trees. So that's my main character, Mimi, being called by something mysterious, but it, something that also seems strangely familiar. And that was me with writing. So in 2011, my kids were in school, my medical practice was established, and I felt the call to do something creative again. And so I took some classes online, and I figured out during taking classes that I wanted to write novels for kids, because those were the books in my life that had the biggest influence on me. And so I started to think about ideas for a book. So I had this memory from my childhood. So my dad, wait, dad, <laughs> he didn't travel much, but when he did travel, he was sometimes gone for up to a week. And I, having an overactive imagination, began to wonder, what if the person who came back wasn't actually my dad, but somebody who looked exactly like him? Like, how would I know? So I had like a series of tests, like things that only my dad would know. And luckily, it was always him. <laughs> but then when it came trying to write a story, I was like, well, what if there was a girl who did, whose dad came back from a trip and was acting really weird, and she was the only one who noticed? How would that happen, and what would happen next? Then I thought about imaginary friends, which I th always thought was uh, just a really cool idea. And then I thought, what if there were an imaginary friend who was actually real? And then, inspired by the woods of Concord, where I walk my dog every day, I thought about what kind of imaginary friend might live there. And that's when I hearkened back to my childhood reading of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And two very specific lines, which I will not tell you now because it's a spoiler, so read the book, um, that would link to the Indian American family that I was creating in my story. And then I had the broad outline of the whole story. How to write it. Like, just because you love books and you know how to read books doesn't mean you know how to write a story. So I drafted this book in 2014, and I revised it over 2015 and 2016. And I started querying agents in 2017, and then I entered a contest called Pitch Wars, um, where unagented authors uh, get apply to be mentored by more experienced authors. And I somehow got in, and I had an incredible mentor who made some amazing suggestions in an edit letter which required eliminating a character from my book. So I basically rewrote the book in two months. And then, but because, directly because of that, I signed with my amazing agent in November 2017, mm. and um, we sold this book in 2018, and here we are today. Um, my dream, the play, is about conflict. It's about conflict between a daughter and her father over whom she should marry. It's about conflict between two friends who used to be as close as sisters, but jealousy gets in the way. Jealousy over a guy, of course. <laughs> and conflict between the king and the queen of the fairies who are fighting over a changeling boy. So the play makes us think about who we love and why, and what loyalty means, and what it costs. But it's all wrapped up in this confection of an adventure told in gorgeous language with magic, mischief, and mayhem in the woods where people emerge transformed. And so, Midsummer's Mayhem is a riff on that tale of mortals caught up in a fairy fight. And although there are fantastical characters in my story, there are lots of them, it's really about the 11-year-old girl, Mimi, who is struggling to understand her place in her family and in the world. I tried to, tried to channel the humor and the whimsy of Shakespeare's play while centering it on uh, a real-world kid with familiar real-world problems that get even more complicated when magic gets mixed in. So in Midsummer's Mayhem, Mimi is 11, and she has three teenage siblings who are super talented in different ways. Henry, the oldest, is an amazing musician, singer, and actor. He's a little bit dramatic. The oldest sister, Rhea, is an incredible dancer and singer. Jules, the second sister, is a virtuoso drummer and a star soccer player. And Mimi feels left out and forgotten. They go next door to meet the teenage boy who's just moved into what used to be Mimi's best friend's house. And here, um, I've included a little love note to the fictional town of Comedy, which might remind you of a place around here. So in the Concord Bookshop, Jules scrunched her shoulders. Welcome to Comedy, the hometown of the talented and famous. <laughs> what does that mean? Cole asked, reaching for a third brownie. We may seem like an, just an ordinary town outside of Boston, said Rhea, 
but dozens of famous people are from here, starting with the Revolutionary War hero, George Babbitt. And the philosopher, David Allen Trudeau, said Henry. <laughs> <laughs> and Teresa Lee Falcott, the writer, said Jules. And loads of others, including last year's winner of American Diva. Fascinating, said Cole. Maybe I won't miss, miss San Diego after all. I rolled my eyes. They'd forgotten to mention the most important famous person from comedy, Puffy Faye. He was the best pastry chef in the country. He'd written my favorite cookbook, and he hosted a baking competition on food TV. But before I could say anything, Henry asked, do you play an instrument? My band's looking for a bassist. I didn't need to hear the saga of Henry's band again, so I wandered to a swing, sat, and inhaled the sharp smell of the woods. There were several acres back there, and a creek that flowed southeast to join the Skedaquid River. Emma and I loved roaming the weeds, the, the woods all year round, but especially in the summer, when sunlight filtered through the leaves, washing everything in shades of green, and the forest was filled with the sounds of twittering birds. We climbed trees, waded into the creek and sat in our hangout for hours telling each other stories about secret forest creatures. Sometimes I could swear I heard the woods talking to me, coaxing me to stay longer. I hadn't had the heart to go there since Emma left, but after hearing that song, I knew I had to. So, just like in A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is set in both Athens and the unnamed mysterious woods behind it, Midsummer's Mayhem is set in the charming New England town of comedy and the mysterious comedy woods where strange things are afoot. And by the end of the book, you will understand why so many people, that so many famous people come from comedy. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so Mimi goes to a new local bakery and meets the beautiful and slightly odd owner, Mrs. T. She finds out that they are holding a kid's baking contest and she wants so badly to win it. But her dad, who is a food writer and usually helps her with her recipes, is acting really weird, eating everything in sight and unable to tell the difference between delicious and disgusting food. So Mimi has to try on her own, and she fails terribly. The writers in this room can understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so terribly that she thinks about giving up on her dream of winning the contest and, and on her dream of becoming a professional baker. And then she meets a boy in the woods named Vic, and he changes everything. Mimi and Vic uh, find exotic baking ingredients, and uh, herbs and spices in the woods, and they bake with them. And then things get a lot weirder in Mimi's home and in comedy. Mimi has to figure out what's going on and how to fix it, including uh, what's wrong with her dad. And she needs to do it all while still trying to win that baking contest and impress her celebrity chef idol. So that's the central conflict of the story. And along the way, there's a lot of baking. Um, Mimi has just tried to advance to the next round, the get into the first round of the baking contest. Um, with cookies that she thought were great, but the owner of the while away, Mrs. T, rejects them as being not special enough, not coming from her heart. So a mean girl, Kira Jones, has already owned this golden leaf and gotten into the next round of the contest, and this really hurts Mimi. And although she still loves baking, she's thinking about quitting, since she really thinks that she's never gonna be good enough at it. When we finally reached home, I went straight to my room and took a long look around at the lavender colored walls with black butterflies, the bookcases under the windows that held all my cookbooks and baking magazines. I loved to bake, but was I doomed to be terrible at it? I opened my closet and reached into a dusty corner where I'd stowed shoes I'd outgrown and extra poster board for school projects. I pulled out my clarinet case, which stared at me accusingly, and my old dance shoes, still shiny and unscuffed, my soccer cleats were tiny and barely used. Maybe I should cram all my cookbooks in there, too. The library would be a better place for them. At least that way, someone could learn something from them, someone who might someday be great. I was fooling myself about my baking abilities if Kira Jones and two eight-year-olds could make it into the next round of the contest when I couldn't. I started to make a pile of books, but when I picked up the cupcake codex, I couldn't bear to part with it. It had given me the inspiration for my Lebanon lavender cupcakes, the best ones I'd ever made. I flopped on my bed to browse through it one more time. I couldn't pay attention, though. My mind kept drifting back to Dad. People's eyes didn't s just start flashing purple. And what about his bottomless appetite? Did he need to see a doctor? Had he actually lost his food writer's sense of taste, or was it just that he didn't want to help me bake anymore? The next thing I knew, I woke to the sound of knocking. I sat up and realized I drooled on my book. <laughs> Come in, I said. I closed the book and rubbed my eyes. Mom carried in two small bowls. She glanced at the pile of books on the floor, then sat at the edge of my bed and handed me a bowl. 
I thought you could use a treat you didn't have to make yourself. The bowl was warm and I inhaled the comforting aroma. It was kesari bath, a dessert mom had learned to make from her mom, who'd learned it from hers in India, and on and on and on for who, who knew how many generations. It was made with semolina, sugar, milk, and ghee, flavored with saffron and cardamom, and studded with raisins and cashews. I tasted a spoonful of the thick golden pudding. It was perfect. How about everyone else? I didn't want to eat all of it, knowing how much the family loved it, especially dad. Don't worry, there's plenty more downstairs, but this is for you and me. I sighed and put down the spoon. I can't believe I failed, again. Mom shook her head and looked at me with her beautiful eyes, so dark they were nearly black. I wish you wouldn't take things so hard, Mimi. I know how much work you put in, and you can always try again. But what if I fail again? What if I fail at everything, always? Life isn't about succeeding or failing. It's about trying your best and loving what you do and being kind. I'd be so disappointed if you were a snide little snake like that Kira Jones. I don't care how many golden leaves she won. <laughs> I gasped in surprise. Then, against my will, I started to smile, and giggles bubbled through me until they burst from my mouth. Mom started to laugh with me, and all of a sudden, neither of us could stop. We laughed until tears ran down our cheeks. I couldn't catch my breath, and Mom clutched her stomach. We lay on the bed and took gasping gulps of air. Eventually, we were able to control ourselves and sit up again. Mom looked at me like I was the only person in the whole world. You remind me of myself, but you're so good at everything and you always know what to do. She snorted. You're a much better cook than I was at your age. You wouldn't believe my dreadful attempts when your dad and I were first married. Really? I giggled again. She nodded. I burned some more things than I can count and we didn't have much money so we had to eat it no matter how bad it was. And I had a real talent for undercooking rice. But I kept at it and read lots of cookbooks and asked both your grandmothers for recipes and eventually I got better. You're the best cook I know. You're the best baker I know. Mom, don't make stuff up. I mean it. Keep baking, honey, because you love it. Contest or no contest, no one can take that away from you. And if you do try the contest again, I think you'll have a great shot. Thanks. I'm not sure what I want to do. Whatever you decide, I'm proud of you. Now move over, said Mom. We propped up pillows, and Mom snuggled next to me while we ate. I liked the sweetness of the sugar and the ghee, the sunniness of the saffron, and the gently grainy texture of the semolina play in my mouth. It was the perfect combination of sweet and savory, smooth and gritty, fragrant and the tiniest bit bitter. It tasted like home. Hmm. Thank you guys for being my home. Ooh. Um, okay, so like, is this a trick question? Because you know <laughs> when you alter the time stream that it alters everything in the future and that maybe this wouldn't actually happen. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess what I would say uh, would be to believe in myself. I think that there's a lot of torture that uh, people in creative fields put ourselves through when it just seems like there are a lot of times you're just beating your head against a wall, like, why am I doing this? Like, nobody's ever gonna read it, no one wants it, you know, like, and um, just to believe in yourself that if you, uh, you know, because I, because I really do believe that the books that people like the most um, are because people, the person who wrote them put something of themselves, something like close to their heart into it. Even the funniest, most ridiculous books, there's, there's a seed there of something that matters to the writer. And so I think I would just tell myself to just put, not be afraid to put your heart on the page and it will pay off in the end. Should we end with that great advice? <laughs> 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 <laughs>